good. Okay, first of all, thank you for inviting me. And I wanna say that this talk is, let's say, you could say integrative or you can say speculative, depending on one's perspective. Um, of the list of um, interests that Priya mentioned, I think I'm talking about them all today in an attempt to show how they're all connected by analogy and thinking about relations. And I'll begin with a quote from um, one of the leading researchers in analogy and my esteemed colleague, and that's Deidre Gettner. And she said that space is the universal donor for relational thinking. And that was said in 2014 in uh, Riga, Latvia. And I, re I remember it well, because I said, wow, that's, that's really, really, really insightful. That could make uh, a big difference. And I've been, for the last eight years or so, reflecting upon this one comment, because I think it really captures a great deal about the relation between space and learning in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, what we in the United States call the STEM fields. Uh, so I want to start with this quote, then I want to be returning to it at different times to think about how and why it might be true and why taking this perspective, which you know, a relational focused perspective on the relation between spatial thinking and STEM learning. Okay. So I'll start off with um, information to show that spatial thinking is related to STEM learning, which now I think is very well established. Uh, there's been many studies that have come out in the past five years or so that strongly show this point. I'll talk about what I mean by relational thinking or what the field means. Then I'll talk about learning about relations in STEM and how that relates to spatial thinking. Okay, okay. so let's start with some well-known anecdotes from the history of science. Kekulé originally, uh, this, most of these tales may well be apocryphal, but they're, they also make the point very well. So uh, Kekulé, the most uh, important uh, discovery in, in the history of organic chemistry, arguably, when he discovered the structure of the benzene ring. And first of all, it de demonstrates the importance of spatial structure because he knew what the uh, elements were, but he didn't know how they were arranged and how they are arranged is uh, incredibly important in understanding their chemical properties. Now, he um, supposedly dreamt of a snake biting its tail. And I never fully understood until about a year ago how you get from that to the hexagonal structure, but it was simply the ring idea. Um, the, the, the hexagon followed from the idea of a connected figure. And so this is one example. Um, a somewhat more recent example is the history of the um, discovery of the DNA molecule. Watson and Crick working on the, um, the, the based on the work of Rosemary Franklin, um, discovered this double helix idea. And lots of different groups were working on this. They all had the uh, components, but it was the critical insight into the spatial structure that allowed them to have this great insight about explanation. Okay, so these anecdotes are, are useful, but uh, there's a lot more empirical research that strongly suggests that spatial ability is related to STEM achievement, attainment, persistence, any of the measures, and even creativity, any of the measures that we care about in, in trying to understand who succeeds at STEM, who continues in STEM, because we have, a, at least in the United States, a substantial problem with people coming in declaring STEM majors and uh, dropping out usually in the second year and often becoming psychology majors. And we need, I like psychology majors, but uh, we also want them, if they're interested in uh, STEM, to, to think about that as well. So what this graph, it's a three-dimensional graph in the sense that the arrows are representing the extra value obtained by looking at a spatial ability score in predicting who went into STEM fields. So the, the X and Y are normalized, uh, I believe SAT scores. And so a score of zero is average. So just looking at X and Y, you could see like people who went into uh, sciences had, um, the other, they're actually, they're good at everything. They're, they're relatively strong at math, at verbal and at uh, spatial. This arrow represents 
uh, how much extra predictive power you get from knowing the spatial ability score above and beyond the verbal and math. And it's quite a bit. In some of the STEM fields, it's actually more than math or uh, verbal. Now, these negative predictions are not, they're not saying that people are bad. It's just relative weighting or tilt of abilities. So these fields, and this is quite old data. It's the only data set we have that's nationally representative and that included spatial ability. Uh, it desperately needs to be done again so that we don't have to keep citing work that started in 1960, but it's, it's what we got. So I'm sure some of these have changed um, and there's some cohort effects here, but still it strongly shows there's a relation between spatial ability and STEM outcomes. Now, the question I've been addressing for some time is why? Why does spatial thinking matter for STEM? Uh, and there are lots of overlapping reasons and none are necessarily mutually exclusive. But I want to try today a general integrating hypothesis um, that the, the fundamental reason is because science is about relational science and mathematics, or at least some of the critical learning challenges are about relational thinking. And as Dedry suggested, spatial cognition and spatial representations strongly support this relational thinking. So relational thinking is a key characteristic of human thought. Um, when we, like Gettner and others have shown uh, in the history of science that there are very important discoveries that were based on the process of analogy. And you can predict both where people went right and some of the uh, garden paths and wrong turns that they took. And relational thinking is particularly relevant for STEM. I would say that to some extent, STEM learning is learning to think about different kinds of patterns and relations. So STEM is all about relations. Students do well when they think about STEM topics relationally. So a lot of expertise and classic examples are in physics, for example, are that the experts can reduce, um, you know, one of these enormous textbooks down to a few categories based in part on how they uh, relate to fundamental forces in the world. So they can take Newton's three laws and relate every problem to it. In, in contrast, the, um, the novices are sort of stuck in surface properties, like this is one about inclined planes, or this one is about pendulums. And they often can get it right, but they fail to benefit in studying a new topic sometimes, or we call it transfer, because they don't see the connection. And those connections are often about relational thinking. Good teachers promote relational thinking when they are talking about STEM. And I wanna make this, this, this argument is gonna go from about age three or four through college. And yes, it's overly bold, but I think there are some connections that when you see the, the ch children are learning about, for example, the properties of numbers, both symbolic and non-symbolic, um, part of the challenge is, is understanding the relational properties of numbers. This, for example, is why we know from Susan Carey, Karen Wynn, Kelly Mix, many, many others that simply um, knowing the numbers is not enough to, to being able to count in no way proves you understand the integer properties of the numbers you're naming. And part of that is you have to have a relational understanding. And part of that may stem in part from spatial representations that I'll talk about. An unfortunate corollary, the last line of this slide is that teaching too often takes them away from relational thinking. In, towards the end, I'll give you some examples of how we teach things like um, fractions and uh, graphs that unfortunately at times um, emphasize precisely the things that uh, relational theory would say we shouldn't emphasize. Those are object characteristics. Now, as um, Goldstone and others have sh shown, sometimes we have to start out concretely and then fade away but it's not clear sometimes that, that, that that fade away is part of the learning plan. So hopefully, and I, there are many exceptions to this and IES and other agencies have, have funded lots of great research on specifically this issue. So the situation, it's not all bad and we are benefiting from the cognitive science 
of relational thinking in education. So what do I mean by relational thinking? Okay, so this is um, very well illustrated by example. I mean, I, I can give a definition, but I think these examples really, um, what I do there. Uh, everything okay on your end? Yeah. Hello? <laughs> Hello world. Yes, everything looks okay. okay thank Sorry. you. We're giving instructions. you a thumbs up in the, uh, in the, but you probably can't see them. I can't so, see yeah, that. Everything's yes. good so far. No, nope, we haven't seen any change on the slides. As many people have pointed out, um, uh, Penn, Holyoke, and uh, Povinelli, and many, many others, going back decades, uh, the relational match the sample task is one that seems to be, okay, there's a debate, but can we teach non-human species to do this? The answer is a definitive maybe. And it's really, really difficult. I mean, you have to have a dedicated student who will spend hours and hours and hours reinforcing them. And then after 10,000 trials, you think you got it. And then they, you switch the stimuli a little bit and they go back to zero. Okay. And if you disagree with me as that characterization of the literature, that's great. But one thing I don't think you would disagree with is that, um, you know, we, everybody knows how smart crows are, right? They're scary smart, but they seem to have some trouble with tasks like this. And likewise, our close ancestor chimpanzees. But in contrast, a four or five-year-old child has no problem doing this at all. And that whether it's a, a difference of kind or, or a quantity is an interesting question, but the, the difference is so dramatic that something is going on. And so these tasks require relational thinking. You have to go beyond the properties of the objects themselves. This is not a question about squares, circles, or triangles, or stars. This is a question about patterns and relations. And once you see that the critical pattern here is two-ness, uh, it becomes very easy. And you're basically, well, you're almost immune to change. I mean, yes, surface changes can make a difference for young children, but you know, it's pretty protective once you get an insight about the relation. And so we've used this very much in the history of science, perhaps. Uh, the best discovery, the best known discovery is the relationship is using the solar system as a model for the atom. Uh, this, of course, was based on 400 years or so of understanding of going from a heliocentric, I mean, going from an Earth-centric to a heliocentric model of the solar system. And the critical thing that's relational here is about orbits. Uh, we are interested in, in how each planet orbits around the sun. And so it maintains that relationship. And yes, each orbit's a little bit different, but that's sort of a secondary fact to understanding the, you can only make sense of those differences if you understand the general idea of orbit in the first place. And then Maxwell and others map that on to the, um, to the atom structure. And although it's far from perfect, it doesn't correctly represent electrons. It does represent uh, a pattern of relations is which the critical insight for thinking about both the solar system and the properties of the atom. In biology, um, you know, uh, Darwin and the Galapagos finches, I mean, to some extent, the discovery of natural selection depended upon these relational insights. So yes, he went and he observed the beaks and he carefully measured and things like that. But it was lining them up like this and looking at the similarities and differences that um, helped him gain an insight. So he could have studied each in isolation, but comp the comparison and the relational structures highlighted both the similarities and differences. And that was one, a contribution to the insights that found the foundation of evolutionary understanding. Uh, this is one of the uh, most important representations in the history of Earth science. It was critically important to um, understanding uh, the continental drift or, or uh, plate tectonics. And they, they didn't have the tools like, like now we can directly measure movement of continents. A um, hundred years ago, those tools were just in their, in their very uh, conceptual infancy. So this is a process of scientific deduction. It's a pattern of the fossils in relation to 
speculations about the shapes of continents and how they might fit together, you, it's very hard to explain the pattern of fossil distribution without understand, without taking into account the geology. So it's the paleontology combined with the geology and those two sets of patterns together. And I will argue the visual representation of those that made this insight possible. So the general point I'm trying to make is very important scientific discoveries are often both relational and spatial. And I think there's a reason for that. Okay, and then so um, we can also use spatial representations to think relationally about non-spatial information. We're so used to seeing these cladograms when we think about evolutionary relations that it's hard to imagine this without it. But there's no um, inherent spatial relation between these. Once we put them in this in this uh, diagram, which is, you know, literally millions of years of time about the evolution of elephants uh, and how they were related and what split off from what, um, and it can be deduced from from DNA and from the fossil record, uh, DNA of fossils when when possible to obtain. So. Um, here we take space and it universally donates to our reasoning about uh, relations among species. That's the idea of universal donor is you can use it for anything um, with some restraints. There's sometimes where it might hurt as well. I don't wanna just praise visual representations, but here's a good example of where it, where it helps. And in chemistry, likewise, okay, so this is the kind of thing that we ask organic chemistry students to do is to see similarities across different models. And different chemistry teachers uh, have different um, uh, favorite models. Some of the models, oh, I knew the dog would eventually bark, but he's been. Um, so, uh, I think the best thing is simply to continue going because <laughs> he will eventually calm down. So we, if you think about how are these two things related? Well, the first thing that pops out to you is their colors are similar. And that's kind of the concrete object-based um, understanding that can give you something of a foothold. But then you start looking for common structures. Something about this ring looks similar here. And you start um, realizing that this is a more abstract representation than this is. In some situations, uh, it helps to have the details and in some it doesn't. Our ability to think relationally allows us to make insights about common structures and to start to learn the foundations of organic chemistry. And it's, it's interesting in the history of chemistry that we thought a great deal about relations. One of the beautiful things about this representation is it organizes, what is it, a hundred and, 18, I don't know, a lot of elements uh, in a very specific, theoretically you know, motivated or coherent way. And as any good scientific theory does, it allows us to make predictions. So um, it's, it's pointed out atoms that should exist, but don't because of the, in, in nature, because of the conditions aren't right, but then people have been able to make them in an accelerators or thing like that. And they knew precisely what to look for. So this is very, very relational and structural. And this is, a, I think, a, a history of sort of trying to understand relations between elements. And it doesn't look like our periodic table, but you can definitely see them struggling and using the representation to try to figure out some of the relations between them. So when we have a complex set of data like this, we're almost, it's almost impossible not to start drawing it out, trying to think about relations. And as I'll show you in a few minutes, students whose drawings are more relational uh, do in fact do better. So this is about taking advantage of the universal donation that the spatial representation can provide. So as you've already heard, I'm, I'm relying in part on theories by Gettner and Markman and, and others about um, how relations and analogy are alike. Relational thinking is the foundation of analogy um, and spatial representations promote that. So analogy can be thought of at two levels. 
objects, I'm going to go quickly because I think most of you know this, but it's important. Objects and relations. So objects are the things that you're reasoning about, squares, circles, electrons, planets, whatever it might be. Um, and relational structure preserves how objects are related, even if those objects are changed. So similar to the first example, most people have no trouble. If I say which of these three, I gave the answer away, so it's not going to be a very entertaining quiz, but uh, most people would not have trouble picking C as the correct answer, even though everything, object property, pretty much is different. It's about circles versus squares. It's using patterns of shading or fill or color versus size. And all of those things, all those object properties are irrelevant to solving the problem. And the fact that we can do this and other species struggle so much is, I think, our, you know, evidence of our relational status. Uh, it's interesting. The um, Forbes, uh, Andrew, uh, I can't remember. <laughs> I'm sorry if you're here, I can't remember your last name, but several other people have modeled uh, the Raven's progressive matrix, which is often seen as sort of like the single, the, the test of intelligence that correlates best with all other tests. Um, and it can be, we know this both empirically and computationally, that it can be thought of as a relational mapping task. And so again, it is both a spatial task and a relational mapping task. And this could be thought of as your ability to take all that the universal donor can give you and solve these problems. Okay. Now, one of the things that comes out of this theory is uh, we can have mismatches between relations and objects. Uh, in this case, uh, the relation is the same, the pulling, but the puller and pull E have been changed. Uh, it looks a little odd. It might be a little bit troubling to a young child, but the basic idea is, is pretty clear, okay? I understand it, the Volkswagen Beetle's being towed in one case and is the tower in the other case, but the relational structure is clear. Um, and we call this an alignable difference because the difference emerges from the alignment. So it's relations first and then uh, we pick up a difference. So sometimes uh, things are seen as different uh, that are actually very related. Hotel and motel is an example. Um, you can come up with a lot of differences between those, but at some great surface object level, they're very similar, but it just shows you how prominent relational thinking is. And we can use it in other examples. This is actually a real um, California flood uh, and when you see the difference, I don't know why before is below, but before and after, uh, you know, it really drives home the difference because the relational structure is the same. You can barely pick it out, but this bridge, fortunately, is still standing. Nothing else is. Um, that relational structure makes us really notice the difference. And likewise, you know, one of the reasons I think that before and after pictures are so popular is they create this alignable difference. It's the same person, but you know uh, the, the, the physical difference really pops out when you align the two. And so um, I, I think there's a reason we're so obsessed with these before and after pictures. Okay, and then uh, many people, Brian Matlin I saw on, on here, there's several other people, uh, uh, Kurt, I'm, I'm having some trouble with names, but in any case, many people have worked on this problem of applying uh, the universal donor of spatial skills and alignment to science learning. So this, this task um, is for students to pick out structural similarities between things that look kind of different to start with. So we, we share a common evolutionary ancestor. We split off a long time ago, but uh, comparing the wing and the arm, for example, and then thinking about how they're used, you see both how they're similar and why and how they're different. So again, it's you're, a lot of what's going on here is you're comparing spatial relations that's facilitated by the representational quality. We so often take that for granted. 
But I really think the two go together, the spatial visualization and the relational thinking. Okay, and so relational, I can't read the top of my slide. So when we do this kind of comparison, it promotes the relational thinking, also abstraction and portable knowledge that we can now think about skeletal properties rather than about individual bones is one, one example. We can think about relations like middle, uh, despite the individual properties like two and four, there's a middle between them, four and eight, there's a middle between them. Uh, those are different numbers, but we still understand the concept. Um, okay. So um, at a psychological level, what I'm saying is that um, we are, and this is pretty well documented through MRI and things, we're taking advantage of some of the properties of the visual system to briefly visualize um, relational information. Um, this is what uh, Taylor and Tversky have talked about the difference between depiction, which this is, and description, which is about language. So one of the, like language is wonderful and distinguishes us as a species and all of that, but it's limited in that we have to, to construct a visual representation purely from a linguistic description is quite in, uh, hard and requires a lot of memory. We can do it, but if you're faced with that task, one of the first things you wanna do is restrict the amount of information and or get a piece of paper where you can now take advantage of the universal donor and think visually. But in both cases, we're sort of uh, using some of the properties of the visual system. Okay, so I, you know, made the case that space is the, or I'm, I'm sort of developing Dedry's case. Um, and you could see it not only in STEM, but in everyday thinking. Um, I wanna make sure I get through, so I'm gonna advance on. I do not wanna color, wow. I am caught in this, okay, I think I escaped. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about early mathematical development. Um, I noticed that Bethany Riddle Johnson was a member of this group. I don't know if she's on, but um, this is um, based in part on, on her research on the value of patterning for learning early mathematical information. I remember a quote, I can't remember who said it, but it's like every good kindergarten teacher knows the value of patterning. Now there's not specific numbers assigned here, but you can, you can do that or, or symbols AAB or something like that or ABA or whatever it might be. But what's so important here is it's about relations, very simple relations, but some kind of relation between the duck and the star or the turtles and the butterfly. And it's in those two top lines, it's depicting two different kinds of relations. And it seems, this is a, a summary of a great deal of research, that patterning is predictive of math skills um, about two years later, two or three years later, and moreover, it can be taught. And I think what we should think about what's happening here in part is we may be facilitating students thinking about relations, not simply about apples or butterflies or turtles or ducks, but the idea of a set of relations may be something that, that this is laying a foundation for. So this is from Bethany's uh, work, uh, sp explicitly saying that patterning involves relational processing. I would like to try to get rid of this red line. Did I, uh, okay, I shouldn't try too much, okay. I think okay, if you restart the um, slideshow, that could work. Um, okay. The other thing is I think there's an icon in the bottom left for your cursor and you may see an eraser there if anybody else. Uh, oh, looks uh, like I, I'm just using the very crude first method of restart. That works. Your okay. second one's very elegant, but I, okay. So uh, somewhere somebody, and it was someone British because they use math plural and Americans tend to say just singular math. Um, but another quote that I can no longer attribute uh, floating out in the ether there is, pattern is the password to math. 
and which I would then translate patterns, password to relational thinking and relational thinking is important for math. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the number line. So um, some of the, one of the things that's happened in the past 10 to 15 years is we're starting to move beyond just simple correlations between spatial skill and STEM learning to much better understanding of how, when, and why that's true. Um, mostly in early math learning, there are some continuations, but one of the nice things that's happened is the alignment between all the research that's gone on in number learning and in spatial learning have kind of come together to give us some insight into what is actually happening when children learn about numbers. And for the first thing is there's a lot to learn. Yes, we know from Spelke and others work that we are born with some very important uh, numerical skills, but importantly, uh, they don't give us all that we need to learn math. Um, we have to map on uh, what we hear, number words, for example, to the linear nature of integers. That seems to be a very important insight, number sense, understanding how numbers increase with increasing quantity and how they're related to one another. Uh, this is work by Elizabeth Gunderson and, and team in which she looked at um, spatial language and number line skill and approximate symbolic calculation uh, years later. And this is interesting because this is a naturalistic study. They went to the home multiple times. This is not an experiment. They did nothing to create the variance that they observed. This is naturally occurring variability. And then they use uh, linear causal models to try to take out variants that might be due to uh, things that you're less interested. The first thing is that spatial skill as measured at age five does predict approximate symbolic calculation where you're asked to add uh, numbers and see how close you can come. Um, but that relationship is mediated by number line knowledge. So if we, if we look at number line knowledge, that absolute correlation here becomes non-significant. This is just classic mediation. So that the variance between spatial skill and approximate symbolic characteristic is largely explained by number line knowledge. And why is that so? Well, I think the number line is one of the first um, spatial representations, be it only in one dimension, but uh, the universal donor is starting to give away uh, information about relations between numbers. So there's debates about what's learned first and, and can you have relations early on without knowing the individual facts and think there's huge debates about all that that I'm just waving my hands both literally and figuratively at. Uh, and it's really important, but it seems to me that one of the things that you get out of the number line and why it's so important is how and why that these are related, that there's increments by one, and then that maps on to an increasing distance in a constant way. So that's absolutely critical information that you don't get simply from counting. So this is why we have two knowers and three knowers and lots of people, um, lots of kids knowing certain numbers, but not knowing how they're related. And that, and the number line, uh, seems to be critically important to understanding that. Part of that is literally learning about the number line and some of it is acquiring a mental number line. Good spatial representations, simple, elegant ones like the number line help us to internalize them. So it become a tool for thought, but it might well start with the external representation and the mapping of that onto the number words that they hear. So this is a critical thing. I think. Susan Carey, I think she calls it something miraculous that happens. Um, it is miraculous, but it's also perhaps somewhat, um, the, the miraculous event is to map on uh, increases that you hear in words to increasing quantity. It's not easy, but I think that the spatial mapping gives us a critical foothold into that relationship that, that we can then uh, build on. Same with fractions. Number lines work and seem to help in fraction too, because what, it's, what, what children have terrible time with is understanding the relational nature of fractions. And they'll often say um, one third is greater than one half because three is greater than two. That's incredibly common error. And also uh, this is like the second great roadblock to learning mathematics. So the first one is number sense. 
If you don't get over that, you're in bad trouble. But then fractions, um, it seems like every other grant proposal that I read in, when I was on the panel was American children are really bad at fractions and fractions are really important for the rest of their lives. And it seems like 50% of the grant proposals had that basic introduction, which shows how important the problem is. Uh, number two, that no one's been able to solve it yet. But number three, they have some intriguing ideas to do so. And a lot of it is about seeing uh, relations amongst numbers. This is conveying a relational understanding. And then we hope that either the teacher or the child on their own will map the numbers onto the partitions. And that's the fundamental insight. We know that um, analogy is used in many learning circumstances. Lindsay Richland and colleagues have shown how important, uh, how interesting differences between how analogy is used in Japan and the United States. Um, so let's just end this part by um, looking at some of the most fundamental roadblocks for learning in mathematics. I've already talked about two, number sense and fractions. The next one, accounting for the other 50% of the grant proposals is algebra. Um, this used to be you know, considered a sort of a traditional eighth grade problem. Now there's attempts to introduce it much earlier embedded within the curriculum, but it seems like a lot of students really have difficulty making that algebraic link. And this is critical because now you're taking math as a symbolic language. And that's one of the things that math is really good for. So functions allow us to think about relations amongst numbers and, and they apply across any individual number. And that, that is definitely a relational understanding. And then finally calculus, which is one that, you know, I'd say most students, you know, eventually get these, but then calculus is kind of, it, it does distinguish people who, who go on in STEM versus, versus those who don't. So high school calculus has become very, very important for predicting who goes into engineering, for example. And that is about relations amongst different functions. So just defining what's being looked at, learn mathematically, uh, rest upon what is being related to what. And so it seems, you know, obviously this is just completely correlational, but it does suggest that when we're changing what the relations are about, children do seem to be particularly at risk for not catching on. And maybe some of our instruction can, can help in that regard. Okay, now I'm gonna very quickly consider um, some rec a recent paper by uh, Haas, Zach Haas and Daniel Ansari uh, about why math and space are related. And I'm gonna do this quickly, but I wanna say that the basic argument I'm making is that each of their four possible accounts really have to do something about relational thinking. That although they don't ever come out and directly say that, I think you can read their paper as saying that. So to be fair, this is my interpretation of their paper. And I should also point out that uh, many people working this, particularly Kelly Mix, sometimes uh, alone and sometimes in collaboration with Haas, are working on this um, in detail to, to try to understand why math and space are related. And of course, I think it's like really important and I'm like hoping we're all converging. Okay, spatial representation of numbers account. That's basically the number line. They're saying that, you know, what I've already said, that space outlines relations amongst the numbers. Shared neural processing, uh, there does seem to be specific brain areas, parietal, one of the sulci of the parietal cortex, that seems to be uh, stimulated or used more to, to share to certain kinds of math problems and certain kinds of spatial problems. Spatial modeling is in some ways what I've talked about the most, which is that we construct a model, be it either physical on paper or in our mind, uh, that allows us to think about the mathematical relations. Now, that number three is basically my favorite approach, although they, they say that these three are not, these four are not in competition. And working memory, that it reduces working memory. And that's certainly true, but importantly, working memory reduction works best when with most efficient when we can apply relational structure to it. And not just a limit, like this is one of the reasons like straight up working memory training 
doesn't seem to transfer because using our working memory is smarter than that. We try to look for patterns and relations. So you can train working memory, but it's been hard in a general way to make it transfer to other things. But I think that's a misunderstanding of how we use working memory. So I don't disagree with any of these. I think what I'm basically saying is number three might be the, the sort of number most important. Now, this is this is my interpretation of, of Hawes and Ansari's interpretation of a study by um, Hegarty and um, Maria Koskonica um, that they did in 1999, where they gave children math problems and then uh, provided paper, but didn't tell them what to do with the paper. I think they might have said, like, drawing a picture can help or something like that. So there are problems like this. A balloon first rose 200 meters from the ground, then moved 100 meters to the east, then dropped 100 meters. It then traveled 50 meters to the east and finally dropped straight to the ground. How far was the balloon from the ground when it started, okay? Some kids draw pictures. This is the graph is picture notion. It's a, it's a represent, it's a basically a narrative, you know? It doesn't tell you anything to solve the math problem. Others do something like this. And I think this is a really good example of spatial. I think this, th there's a reason that drawing the arrows, arrows are, are about relationships between direction and well, force or distance. And um, they could simply list the numbers, you know, but there's a reason as a transition from the physical actual things that happen to more of a relational structure that comes out because of the spatial modeling. So we can have a long debate about just how important is a spatial representation to solving this. I could see it all the way from critically important to just almost like an epiphenomenon. It's just making the child write out the right numbers. Even if it's only that last one, that's still important. But I think it actually is much more than that in that they're, they're imagining it traveling the space and then assigning a number and then thinking about how that number has to relate to the next number. So the spatial modeling is part of the numerical um, problem solving in my mind. Okay. Uh, another example that Hawes and Ansari cite is in some brain damaged patients seem to have a non-relational understanding of betweenness or middle. So if I say draw a midpoint between two and six, it's easy. Um, and I, as long as I keep it proportional on the two sides, the two numbers, it's gonna be the same place. But in, this, in these patients uh, with parietal right brain damage, they um, are more influenced by the larger number. So they, know, they seem to know it has to be somewhere between. So they understand betweenness, but not middleness in a way, in an interesting way. And that is exactly a relational understanding is that the, the middle is, or midpoint is the, based upon the relation between the two. And this is a difficulty in mapping space back toward number. So it works both ways. And I thought this separation again shows just how important the relational understanding is. Okay, now this is the most speculative. I, I couldn't resist putting it in uh, and I know Okay, even saying there's any relationship between music lessons and an IQ is con very controversial. First of all, I'm not talking about the no Mozart effect where you play Mozart and then they do better on spatial ability. That's specifically, that has a mean effect size of zero. It's just, it was a odd finding that was published. Meta-analysis showed that it was, that it was an odd finding. But I hear I'm talking about learning about structures and patterns and relations. And in this regard, we've wondered sometimes, are some instruments going to make this pattern easier to see than others? I think that keyboards actually, you know, replicate a pattern. Uh, and this is something I've never seen tested, but I would love to see how music lessons affect IQ in, for different instruments. So a guitar is an interesting contrast that I'm, as I've been struggling to learn myself, um, the patterns are there. But boy, they're hard to find. Um, there's nothing about the guitar itself that tells you that it's the length of the strings that matters because they all appear pretty much the same length. And they certainly uh, look that way at the first fret. If you understand the engineering of it, you could get some insight that it's string length. 
But also the first thing they teach you is basically where to put your fingers down to make different sounds, which doesn't tell you hardly anything about the relation. And so I cannot imagine learning guitar without having studied keyboard. I know what happens. And I'd like to see those, those kids because the, the relative insight here is to me just, just less apparent. Now, some guitar player could certainly say why well, I'm wrong and I'd love to hear it. But from this one perspective, I find the relational structure here much harder to find. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about learning about relations. Um, so I said that sometimes, unfortunately, uh, we emphasize object properties. It may not be the best. Stephen Frank and I, and I have explored this a little bit. Um, so if you have had kids, if you're around my age and have ki had kids approximately 20 years ago, you could not avoid Dora, Dora the Explorer. Dora the Explorer is very popular. And one of her several things that she does is use a map. And the map comes out and sings, I'm the map, I'm the map. And then she says, okay, let's look at the map to see where we will be going. Well, I love maps because they communicate relational information. But the way they teach it in Dora the Explorer is exactly the opposite. So the map comes out and he shows you this path that says, first we'll see the Ferris wheel and then we'll see the carousel, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I guess it's a little bit relational, but it's nothing like what we would typically use a map for. So if you said, um, how do I get from the carousel to whatever the endpoint is? Uh, the map is superfluous. You could easily describe that in words. It's cool that you could do it visually, spatially, but you're not taking advantage of the unique characteristic. You're not donating uh, relational thinking because you don't need it to solve this task. Uh, when we use maps for things like where is one city in relation to another, and there's multiple cities, then we're really talking about relational thinking. Then we really need a map. And then about half my life has been devoted to studying how those uh, using maps in that way facilitates spatial and relational thinking. Okay, another example is graphs and charts. Um, one of the things that we do, and now I, to be fair, you can't, you know, concrete this fading and everything, you, you can't just jump into the relational structure without some instruction. So I'm not, I, I'm just, I wanna make sure that you go beyond this. You can start here, but you probably shouldn't end here. And so you're asking the kids to make graphs. Um, and um, this is the number of vehicles that we're doing and it's emphasizing, okay, it's mapping vehicles on two units and that's good. But what we would really use this for is um, if we wanted to reason about a question such as the following, um, how many more race cars were there than there were fire, fire engines or something like that? Then the length of the, um, the bars is really, really important. And that's what we kind of use. Like when we use graphs to understand interactions, we're comparing two patterns and I tell my students not to include these blocks and everything because what you want to see is relations between lines. Also think about what's how you should arrange ascending to descending or descending to ascending. This doesn't do either one of those. So yes, you're teaching the child how to map concrete things onto space and that might be a very necessary first step, but the relational power of the graph is not well illustrated in this example. And I've written about this before in the use of manipulatives, concrete blocks to help kids learn mathematics. This is one of my favorite sets, the um, Cuisinaire rods. They can be purely relational because you're learning about mapping different lengths, visual lengths to, um, you know, of different size and seeing how you can compose it. Then you can count, you know, say, for example, it takes... Uh, two yellows to equal one red or something like this. In a, sort of an instruction book for using these Cuisinaire rods that I have, um, they say explicitly, do not assign numbers to the bars too early, okay? But it's very common to say red is one, oh, gray, whatever color that is, tan is one, red is two, green is three. 
And that is taking away from children thinking about seeing relations, seeing some initial insights into multiplication, seeing the relationship between length and then ultimately number in this multiplicative way. So um, when we always start with object information, we may need to start there, but we have to be careful not to end there when we're using these concrete tools, because all of these have this power to donate relational thinking, but the question is, do we take advantage of that? Um, now, as I said, maps really are really great at this. And this is a, I'm sure you've all seen Jon Snow's map of cholera cases in London. This is the first geographic information system. Uh, they knew that cholera was a communicated disease, but they didn't know the vector, uh, water versus air. Uh, it's interesting, we saw when with COVID, people were actually were having, not about water, but air versus droplets that had, that with your hands versus in the air. And it took like, apparently it took six or seven months to fully convince people it was airborne. Uh, and apparently we want to resist the notion that seems too magical or something. They actually like to see something concrete uh, if it's, and, and air seems unscientific or something like that. I, there's an interesting philosophy of science there. But anyway, um, eventually uh, snow mapped out the cases and the pumps, and then the relation springs out. Then we have some alignable differences. Cases where we have pumps, but almost no cholera cases. And then the Broad Street pump was the central uh, problem and everything spread out from that. In some cases, people would get their water from Broad Street and then walk away. Allegedly, it was the best water for making beer. So that accounts for some of the diffusion, but the cholera cases were being spread through the Broad Street pump. And the wonderful, elegant solution was simply to remove the handle on that pump. And the point I'm trying to make is it's the space is giving you that relational information, the uh, spatial representation. Uh, as time is running out, I'm going to talk very briefly about some of my efforts to help students capture something of what John Snow captured to promote relational thinking by using what are called geographical information systems. And this is work I'm doing with Bob Culvert, Stephen McGee and others in the Chicago public schools. Uh, we're doing this in what's called career and technical e education, which some of you may have known before as vocational education, where the goal is more career oriented. Some do go on to college, some don't, some go to trade schools. We're trying, GIS, Geographical Information System, is one of the, um, I'm not there, is one of the um, top five growing careers. Uh, I think after like 25 years of saying how important it was, I think it may now be, be uh, taking off. And it's really exciting to see. And the argument is that it promotes children's thinking about patterns and relations, which is what I say science and engineering are to some extent about. So in a geographical information system, it's a, it's a computer-based system for representing spatial information. And when you pick up a paper map, you're kind of stuck with what you get, okay? Whatever the cartographer decided to represent and how they decided to do that is what you have. In contrast with a GIS, you choose how it should be represented and importantly, what should be represented. And you can stack these layers and take them on and turn them off as you're making a decision. So where should we put a new park or a new business or whatever? You might wanna consider different kinds of information. Um, you know, Where is the land available would be one of the first questions to ask. Um, is it accessible by streets? Who lives there? Things like that. Those are all different data sets that you can project onto the representation. You can turn them on, you can turn them off. Google Maps is a very simple GIS, uh, but in less simple forms, it involves, it, it facilitates greatly complex problem solving, like things related to climate change. Those are going to involve multiple patterns, multiple relations. It's not like, you know, people should, should drive their car less. Yes, that's true. That would help tremendously. But that alone is not going to be the solution. We're going to need to consider where and how and when and why and multiple variants like that. We, we want to take advantage of 
a new kind of universal donor here and it's uh, multiple spatial representations. So we have, we, over the course of the semester, we have students think about uh, complex real world problems like the placement of wind farms. Um, now, it's, it's really a very interesting engineering challenge. And one of the things I'm learning about engineering is things are constantly changing. So the steel, uh, how far down the steel can go is a function of steel production and steel cost. It's, it's both a trade-off of technology and economy. So uh, how deep should we put them? Uh, if we wanna get them far offshore that protects the shipping routes and maybe helps with the bird migration. Um, but then on the other hand, then we have a problem. They have to be more resistant to deeper levels of water. They also have to have a, a access to the existing infrastructure somehow. So those become harder. So those are the kind of real trade-offs that real engineers face. Engineering is, is a compromised discipline. It's about what am I going to trade off to get what the best I can have for this particular problem? And that's what we want them. And it's inherently spatial. It's about locations and relations. And so in this geospatial semester, they solve problems like this. This is one of their solutions, a very different kind of problem, still an engineering problem, I think. Uh, this is from a, a rural high school right adjacent to uh, Shenandoah National Park. The geography of Shenandoah National Park is that um, it's very thin and narrow. So the distinction between what is park property and what is, you know, a, a village is, is not as great as it might be, say, in Yellowstone National Park, where you have literally hundreds of square miles of park with no connection to the outside. Almost everything in Shenandoah Park is connected pretty closely to the outside. And that means the bears who are fully protected in the park, there's no hunting allowed in the, in the park. Um, they can easily get out and into these villages. And it's not good for the bear or for the people whose backyard they go into. Um, and so the students in this particular high school, it's very close to the National Park. It's very part, part of their, their stewards of the park in their mind. It's very part, part of their environment. It's part of their um, economic um, health of their uh, community rests upon visits to the park and, and things like that. So uh, many of their parents work in the park. Um, and so one of the students said, what do we do with the bears that we catch? how can we reduce the chances of them ending up? Well, partly it turns out there's like families of bears. Uh, they don't, they're not particularly social, but they, they tend to stay closer to ones they're related to, the ones that they're not. And so you have these problems of like, we wanna put them with their family. We want to get them as far away from access to get back into the neighborhood as we can. You can't just put it in the back of a Toyota and go up the hill because uh, it's big and unsafe. So you have to think of all these constraints and it's a real mapping task. And so, you know, this is the kind of problem that they solve. I'll skip that one. We, um, we have been assessing the effects of this course at the neural and cognitive level. Does it make a difference in how students think? Um, to our knowledge, when I say, oh, this is um, Adam Green, Rob Cortez, uh, David Kramer, Bob Colbert, and uh, several others. Um, this is um, the first course that we know that's been assessed in a, uh, using neurocognitive imaging where the, the effect of an entire class with any kind of control group has been assessed because it's hard. You know, It just so happened that uh, Adam Green working at Georgetown and having several kids in the surrounding suburban school districts was perfectly positioned to uh, recruit them and actually drive them, uh, provide transportation for them to get from the western suburbs of Washington, D.C. into Washington, D.C. and into the MRI, as well as a control group. So um, a control group that was taking another class. So there, it's not a perfect control group because we can't have random assignment. We did try to use some of the modern strategies for matching propensity scores and things like that, that can reduce, but not eliminate possible confounds there. Uh, so I'm gonna compare the, this is a, a, one of our, what we call transfer questions. And we give questions to the students where they have to propose a solution. The problems are selected 
we hope to be, um, they could be solved either spatially or not. And the question is, having been in this course for almost an academic year now, do you see this problem as spatial or not? The question he would ask is, what would you do if you were campaigning for local office? How would you, uh, how will you um, get the word out? You're gonna hear him mention campaigning for gay marriage. Fortunately, the Supreme Court took care of that, but unfortunately, <laughs> We might have to do it again based on what some statements have come out. Sorry for the political thing there. But watch his hands. He's in the map group. Probably first I would use probably something GIS related to find an area that would probably maybe suit me more, like maybe like my platform. Uh, say like I was maybe I was for gay marriage, for example. So I do like a map and I have like a poll. I can find like data and like who supports it or not, and then plotting it like on a map I could see who supports it and then maybe campaign there like I'll do a lot of campaigning there so make sure to secure those votes or something like that. So you can see to him this problem immediately is thought of spatially and through the GIS tool. How long that lasts is a really good question that I don't really know the answer to but it lasts at least uh, portions of a school year and so we're giving him this problem having worked with GIS he, need, he now applies those techniques Here's a, another student. Now, yes, she's female. I'm not trying to illustrate uh, uh, gender differences. She just was a really good example. There actually are no gender differences in this, but it's just the example. Um, so she's in the control group. The control group was either uh, AP physics or AP history. I could explain our selection about that or both. Uh, many students take both. Um, and her answer is a perfectly good, reasonable answer. It's just not very spatial. Oh, let's look at it. Since it's local, I really want, want to speak to as many citizens of the town or county as possible. Um, that would be very important because they would have a closer relationship with me than they would if um, I was running for like a congressional seat or something like that. So a couple things to note is her answer is based on sort of networking, which is kind of spatial, but she doesn't specify how that network would go. It's about social relationships, which is very, and then how to sort of focus those to local businesses. It's a very good answer, but it's not spatial. The other thing is that her hands don't move at, hardly at all. And when they do, it's what, uh, I think what's called a deictic gesture. It's kind of like just pointing or beating to keep the speech going. Whereas the, the first person used his hands to illustrate a map. So and we have more evidence than these two anecdotes to suggest it's actually making a difference. I'm running out of time, so I'm, I'm not gonna go into detail, but we have four interviews across the quarter where we ask them questions like this. And one simple measure based on work by James Pennebaker, basically what people talk about reflects how they're thinking. And we can use dictionaries of spatial words. So basically they're thinking more spatially and the control group is actually thinking a little less spatially, although uh, not significantly so. So there, this big difference between the black bars um, is illustrative that something changed. And um, recently, this just came out, it's online, Science Advances, this is Rob Cortez's first author, uh, where we looked at um, neural and cognitive or behavioral measures of spatial reasoning. And use syllogisms here because that's even more removed from the actual specific problem. This is a spatial syllogism where you have the basically you just say yes or no, and we can measure your reaction time. Um, there's a huge debate about whether people solve these propositionally, spatially, or both. Um, I think what we can say is after they take the uh, geospatial semester they're more likely to solve them in a visual spatial manner. Uh, the areas of the brain associated with that um, are more activated and areas that are more associated with verbal processing are less activated. Um, and you can read about that in the paper that's just finally out online. So they also very cleverly came up with non-spatial relationships and showed that even the non-spatial syllogisms are solved more spatially with more relevant brain activation. Sorry, I am rushing. Uh, we found particular evidence for finding embedded figures. Uh, this idea we hope is, is catching on that spatial relationships help 
across the STEM curriculum and even perhaps in any curriculum that has to deal with distributions like, like history. So University of Redlands is a small liberal arts school in California and they call themselves a special university and their first year seminars are basically GIS classes. And from that, they, they teach religion and theater and history using these, these spatial tools. But we can see it all over um, curricula where children can see patterns and work on patterns. Here is the Carnegie Mellon, Carnegie Mellon um, preschool. And they put your picture on one of these and then you have to figure out where you're supposed to sit. So it's a very simple mapping task. And they can ask questions about who you'll be sitting next to and without looking at the picture and things like that. Okay, so we can do real spatial reasoning in young children too. Okay, so to sum up and to end, um, relational thinking is critically important for science and engineering. It is perhaps a unique characteristic of human thought. Uh, and space is the universal donor for relational thinking. So that I think is the high level explanation for why space and STEM are related because you need to think about relations and relational thinking is promoted by using spatial visualizations. Maps are one good example of that and have been for millennia or at least centuries. Okay, thank you very much. I do have this thank you slide. Um, I, I, there's some time for questions, so let's jump.